So, good afternoon and welcome to the Sir Wilfrid's general election debate for 2017. The election has been called at a challenging time when our relationship with Europe is unsure as Brexit approaches. A new government will have to make difficult choices regarding national spending and borrowing. And as the tragic events in Manchester this week demonstrate, the primary job of any government must be to ensure the safety of the population. We're delighted to have representatives of the main political parties present with us today, two of whom are standing as candidates to become Member of Parliament for Crawley. Today's debate has been streamed live to all our classrooms and also live on Facebook, so welcome to all of you watching outside this hall. With me on stage are Councillor Bob Lanza from the Conservative Party, Tim Lunnan of the Labour Party and Marcos Kapanovic of the Liberal Democrats. Let's welcome them. So, good afternoon and thank you for coming. Um, you have nearly 118 year olds in this school and will have a chance to vote for you for the first time on June the 8th. So why should they vote for you or your party, Bob? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for this opportunity, this invitation. It's, it's a very important uh, general election. We want as many people to vote as possible. Uh, first of all, we in the Conservative Party uh, believe in individual freedom and choice as far as uh, we can take that. Uh, in individual choice, freedom of choice, it operates at uh, various levels. We don't mean freedom to break a speed limit, but by way of illustrating it, if you imagine 500 MPs voting on uh, which smartphone they would prefer, 400 vote for Samsung and 100 vote for an Apple, the 100 who vote for an Apple smartphone are still free to go out and get it. And that's a kind of principle of freedom of choice. We believe in opportunity in helping everyone to be the best that they can possibly be in society, in terms of education, in terms of their employment, and throughout their lives, regardless of their background, that fundamental belief in the equality of opportunity. We believe very much in democracy and extending democracy, and I do believe that if you look around the world, if you had more democracies, it would be a more peaceful world, and that's something we're committed to as well. It's very rare for one democracy uh, to wage war upon another. We also believe in investing in state services, the investment in education and the NHS and in social care will all increase under a Conservative government. The state has a very proper role to play in ensuring that we have the best possible public services that we can. Underpinning all that and making all that possible is, is the economy, the way we manage the economy. We avoid too much debt. We ensure that there is economic growth so that there is money to pay for everything that we promise and that we can sustain and improve our uh, public services uh, as well. So that fundamentally is what we stand for. We do want to reach out to all sections of the community uh, in terms of what we put in our manifesto. And it's very pleasing for me today to be literally uh, standing in the centre ground. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so Tim, yes. why should our 118 year olds in Year 13 vote for the Labour Party? So my name is Tim Lunnan. I'm a Labour councillor in Broadfield and I'm very proud to be the Labour Party candidate in this election. The Labour Party was set up over 100 years ago because working people of the time didn't have representation from the Liberals or the Tories. I joined the Labour Party because I wanted to be part of a party that treated you the same no matter your background, that gave you the same opportunities no matter your wealth, looked after you the same no matter your success or failures in life. Over its history, the Labour Party has delivered on these promises time and again. Out of the ashes of World War II, we created the NHS, free healthcare at the point of service for every citizen in this country. We'd started the decolonisation process that saw countries plot their own course throughout the world, not dominated from London. And we created Crawley Newtown, because we need, people needed houses from the bombed out suburbs of London. In the 1960s, we, we legalised homosexuality so you weren't punished for who you loved. We um, introduced the Open University so you could study from home. And we also introduced the Equal Pay Act so women and men weren't competing between themselves as to who could get paid more and everybody was treated the same. From 1997 onwards, we created the Children's Short Start Centres. We bought peace in Northern Ireland and also introduced the national minimum wage so that everybody would be paid enough. 
at this election, you've got a choice. You've got a choice between the Conservative Party that's talking about personality but doesn't want to have a face-to-face -face debate, or the Labour Party that's committed to policies that will make your life better. At this election, you've got a choice between a Conservative Party that's had seven years of education cuts that have, that have resulted in possible four-day weeks, which might sound great to you guys, but will be chaotic for the, the rest of the country, um, and possible bankruptcies in Crawley to the schools, or educational maintenance allowance returned, student fees scrapped, free school meals for primary school children. At this election, you've got a choice between a party that's failed on its previous promises on immigration, on scrapping the deficit, and on uh, national insurance rises for self-employed, or a Labour party that's committed to a national minimum wage for all of £10 an hour, to properly funding an NHS that will mean that your grandparents, if they get dementia, don't have to pay for their house for their care, and a, a government that's committed to 10,000 more police and providing security on our streets. Ultimately, this election, if you are between 18 and 24, and I'll come on to this, you'll be better off under Labour. If you're a pensioner, you'll be better off under Labour. If you earn under £80,000, you'll be better off under Labour. And if you work in or rely on the public sector, you'll be better off under Labour. It's because Labour's building a government for the many, not the few. Now, for a lot of you, this will be your first election, and it's a good question as to what Labour can do for you. I've already touched on a few of those things. We're talking about a £10 minimum wage that isn't segregated by age gaps. So whether you're 16 or 21, you'll get the same minimum wage. So you won't be penalised for being young. We're going to bring back housing benefits for under 21, so that if you want to move out, you'll be supported by the government if you can't fully afford your own house. We've also talked about lowering the vote to 16, which is something that you can do if you're in Scotland, and we want to extend that. If you can pay taxes, join the army, or get married, we think you should also get the vote in the Labour Party. So there's a whole host of reasons that in the Labour Party we think you should vote for us if you're young, and also we'll be building a country that is more inclusive and better for you as a whole. So that's why. Thank you very much, Neil Tim. Okay, and... Marco, with your Lib Dem badge on, why should, why should they vote for you? Thank you. Um, I stand here today as a local lad. I went to Our Lady Queen of Heaven School. I came here to St. Wilfrid's for my studies. I went to university in nearby Guildford, and I spent the last two years working in the Crawley area in Gatwick Airport. And one of the things which I've kind of noticed as I've grown up is that actually, in, in a kind of way, we're all different. So some of us like different kinds of music, for instance. Some of us might like pop music. We might like rock music. Some of us might like grime. We might be of different religions, or we might, might not be of any religion at all. But yes, these are our differences. But as liberal Democrats, we believe that it's our differences that make us unique, that make us individual. And that ought to be celebrated and protected. And the best way to protect that is to learn about one another. And liberals believe in a strong, broad, and good education for everyone. That's the key to success. So from appreciating the work which teachers do on a day-to-day -day basis, to giving schools every resource they need, to making sure each of you as students can study whatever subject you want to, that's part of what it means to be a liberal and have a liberal education. We defeat ignorance. We defeat misunderstanding through a good education. And together, that makes us stronger. So if you want to protect individuality, education, if you want to cherish individuality and education, and if you want to celebrate individuality and education, I urge you to vote Liberal Democrat on June the 8th. Thank you. OK, thank you very much indeed, Marco. So we have our first question from the floor from Nia Hawkes, who's in the front row here. OK. West Sussex School will see some of the lowest funding of all allocations in the country, and this will continue to be the course after the current proposed funding formula. How will your party demonstrate to us that we are not worth less than other students around the UK? Okay, thank you, Nia. So in, in this county, we have one of, the, one of the lowest funding allocations. How will your party demonstrate to us that we in Crawley, in West Sussex, are not worth less than other students around the UK? Bob Lanza. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, I, I agree with your comments that the funding formula has been uh, too low. This is always the problem with formulae. They, um, some areas don't get as much as they sh should, and that's certainly applied to West Sussex. Our MP, uh, Henry Smith, and indeed all West Sussex MPs, uh, have been active in lobbying the government to improve the funding situation for West Sussex. 
and they, and they will be in the future, regardless of which political parties uh, form that government. And as a result of that lobbying, the new national funding formula has been introduced, and that does provide uh, an additional £5.7 million for West Sussex education, which represents an increase of 8.4%. That's one of the largest um, increases in funding as a result of the new funding formula. But certainly we undertake to continue to do that, even if it, you know, whether it's a Conservative government or whatever, we would, we would do that and lobby that government to, to do the right thing for West Sussex schools. Okay. Well, I, I noted this morning uh, on the news that the uh, Institute for Fiscal uh, Studies said that the proposals would lead to a 2.8 cut over the next five years with the Conservative proposals. Um, anything to say on that, Bob? Well, um, I believe again that the proposals with the new funding formula add, add 5.7 over time and an 8.4% increase. So, in terms of those, those are the Conservative proposals, but what on earth does the Labour Party do? So the Labour Party is committed to investing £6.3 billion, sorry, £6 billion pounds into more school funding, including, uh, in, including a new formula that will mean that uh, funding is provided per pupil, not as a block grant across the state. Um, and it's nice to hear the Conservatives say that they'll do the same, but they've had seven years to do the same, and they're responsible for getting us into this mess in the first place. But our funding proposals won't just stay, stop there. We're committed to reintroducing EMA so 16 to 18-year-olds don't have to make a choice between education and work. We're committed to scrapping tuition fees so that you're not labelled with a £40,000 worth of debt once you've committed, uh, finished your st studying. We're also going to guarantee free school meals for primary school children. That, that might not affect all of you, but... It might in future, if you have children of your own, want to make sure that everybody's given the same start for each day. But we've also seen, as you've touched on, that the Institute for Fiscal Studies has carried out a study of the Tory and Labour manifesto proposals. Labour are coming in at 6.6% more per pupil over the next five years if you vote for Labour. So education will be funded per pupil roughly 6.6% better than, the Conservative, than where you are currently, whereas the Conservative proposals are roughly 2.8% less. So that's a, a total swing, as it were, of 9% difference per pupil between Labour and between Tories. And that's because Labour doesn't see you as just a cost that you've got to take account of. We see you as our future. We're willing to invest in you and make sure you get the best education. Because with Brexit coming, there will be a skill shortage in this country, and we need our people to be as educated as possible so they're ready to fill that gap. And that, those people are going to be you. OK, thank you. Well, it's interesting that the Conservatives come out and say we will lobby whoever's in government as well. Our MP is Conservative, the West Sussex County Council is Conservative, most of Parliament is Conservative, our government is Conservative. You're going to lobby yourselves for more money? That doesn't really work out and it's interesting that this... Okay, please let the man finish. Thank you. It's interesting that this funding formula happens to come at election time as well. Now, the Liberal Democrats from day one will invest an extra £7 billion per year into education. We want to broaden the curriculum because at the moment it's too narrow. Take English literature, for instance. We don't learn about world literature anymore. We're just learning about British poetry and British books. That's not right. We need to expand our horizons as much as possible. Also, we want to make sure teachers get the help and satisfaction they deserve. We will lift the public sector pay cap and ensure that teachers' wages carry on rising with inflation rather than at 1%, because teachers have done a great job the past couple of years, and they deserve the recognition they need. And, and most importantly, we will oppose grammar schools and free schools, and that money will be redirected into our state education system. <laughs> so we may well touch on those topics later as well. Okay. Um, we have another question. Uh, another question here. I think it's. Uh, I think it's also prescient to say that uh, if our school was funded like London schools, we would, we at Sir Wilfrid's would be able to employ 30 more teachers. Uh, that's another question for you and whichever government gets formed for you to, to be to thinking about. But our next question is from Jonathan Fines. Jonathan. How would your party ensure that Brexit is a success for the future of the people in the school? So, how would your party ensure that the Brexit negotiations would work for the future of the young people in this school? 
Right, thank, thank you very much for your uh, question. And um, this, this is about um, r robust negotiations with the other seven, <coughs> 20, 27 uh, European uh, Union countries to get the best deal for Britain. It means not having to pay out some massive amount of money for withdrawing uh, from the uh, European Union itself so that we have more money to spend on education and all of our public services. And, and particularly, I mentioned there's around 140,000 uh, European Union nationals who uh, work for the NHS, so we need to ensure their freedom of movement within those negotiations to ensure that our services uh, remain uh, at the highest possible standard. But it does need um, a strong leader uh, to do that. You think of Think about it, you're putting yourself up against 27 other countries in negotiations. And you, what you don't want is a lot of uh, divisiveness in that process within the House of Commons. And this is one of the reasons that the uh, Prime Minister called the general election to try and strengthen her hand in those European negotiations. Never underestimate the challenge of negotiating with 27 other countries, all of whom have formed an initial common opinion about the British exit. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. So, Tim, yeah. at, at this election, you've got, again, a choice. You've got a choice between a party that's committed to being tough and difficult and a hard Brexit, or you've got a party that wants to make a negotiation with you that isn't a winner and a loser on either side, but actually makes both sides win. We've got a tremendous amount of uh, industry in Crawley. I work in Manowar as an engineer. There's also Gatwick, which is hugely dependent on what goes on in Europe. We can't afford, Crawley cannot afford to leave Europe at any cost. We need to make sure we get a deal for Crawley that works for Crawley. Open skies, the, the agreement that allows planes to come in and land from Europe and our planes to go and land in over there, needs to be renegotiated. If that agreement isn't made, then there won't be any planes taking off a landing from Gatwick to go to Europe. No, no deal is not a good deal for Crawley, that much is clear. But at this election, UKIP have stood down in Crawley because they're so supportive of the Tories' view that we must get Brexit at all costs. Now, I'm not saying we need to dilly-dally on uh, Brexit. We need to make a good deal of it and go forward. I'm an optimist at heart. I voted Remain last year, but I've accepted the result as a Democrat. Uh, and we need to make the best deal of it for Crawley. But we can't go in just trying to be difficult and not making friends with Europe. The best way to go about these negotiations is trying to come with, with a collaborative approach and um, making sure that we get a best deal that suits everybody. This is, we're going to be having relationships with Europe for the remainder of our generation, generations to come. So just making enemies of them for the sake of this deal isn't going to benefit Britain or Crawley in the long run. So we need to make sure we get a, a Brexit that works for everybody in Crawley. There's a lot of jobs in Crawley that are dependent on what goes on in Europe and we can't just cut off our nose to spite our face. Okay, thank you, Tim. So, how are the Lib Dems ensure that Brexit works for the young people in this country? Lib Dems are very, very Remain based, aren't they? Yes, yes, we are. And I was actually here last year for the EU referendum debate. And two big promises came out from the EU referendum campaign. One of them being, and I'm sure we can all remember that big bus with £350 million a week for the NHS. That's gone. That's disappeared. That's not a promise anymore, apparently. That's been forgotten about. It's in no one's manifesto. And that's part of the problem which we have. Because promises were made during that referendum campaign, which aren't being kept. And there's only one party which is giving you the power to hold your government to account on the final deal. And that's the Liberal Democrats. Because, and again, no one told you, but Brexit's a three-stage process. We have the initial triggering of Article 50, we have the negotiations itself, and then we have votes on the final deal. And our proposal is to give you guys, the people, a say on the final deal. So if the final deal isn't something which will benefit your future, you can stop it. You can say no. If the final deal doesn't have the promises which were offered to us during the referendum campaign, you can say no. You can stop it. And it doesn't matter whether you vote Tory or Labour. They will not give you that promise. Only we will. So, just a, for clarification then, I know Tim Farron, the Lib Dem leader, is you know, uh, totally for having another referendum 
What's the Labour Party stance on no, that? Look, you can't go into negotiations not being able to deliver on what you negotiate. You need to have the authority to deliver what it is. And also, the, the EU referendum, as I'm sure we'll all agree, was very divisive for this country. It stirred up a lot of hatred. If we had to go through it all again, I don't think it would be good for the country. And ultimately, what the Lib Dems are promising can't be delivered. Everybody knows they can only get into government forming a coalition with the Conservatives and the Labour Party. No. Both the Conservatives and the Labour Party are committed to taking us out of Europe as the will of the people dictated and the will of people poorly dictated. I didn't like the result, but we are committed to taking us out of Europe. And the Lib Dems can't deliver on their manifesto promise. It's much like tuition fees back in 2010. It's another promise that they can't keep, but they're trying to stick out there so that people think, oh, that might be a good idea. But it won't happen. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, uh, well, I, well, I'm picking up, Mark, and I'll come to you next, Rob, is that actually I think Tim's saying that if you don't accept the result of that election, then you're not actually a Democrat, even though you're a Liberal Democrat. Yeah. No, not so. We accept we are leaving the European Union. It's about the terms on which we leave and making sure that actually it's not one which damages our future. Because the wrong kind of Brexit can give a, us a black hole in our finances of 36 to 50 billion pounds a year, depending on how bad it is. So it's in all our interests to get this right. And the people have to have the final say on the matter. And also, in terms of us opening up whole territory, it's not so. And actually, you know what? If Donald Trump can get in, then why can't the Liberal Democrats? Anything can happen in an election. Oh. Strange things have happened. <laughs> oh. um, okay. Donald well, uh, ask, ask that last question about why not the Liberal Democrats. How long have you got? <laughs> um, but on the on the subject of a second of a second referendum, no, I, I, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, I voted Remain um, personally but I respect the result of the referendum. And if there were a second in-out referendum, I know you're not proposing that, but if there were a second in-out referendum, I'd vote to leave to uphold the result of the first one because I respect the first result. Now, I would not support a second referendum, and I don't believe there's an appetite amongst the British public for yet a nas another national poll. I just don't believe that's the case. Oh, general election. Mm. I took a sweepstake as to how long it would take before someone mentioned Donald Trump, and there we go, I'm too far off my, uh, my view there. Um, we have another question now, moving on to a different topic, um, from Charlie Thorogood. Charlie. In your opinion, which is more important, being able to pay down the national debt or being able to properly fund schools, hospitals and social care services? Okay, thank you. An austerity question there. What's more important, paying down national debt or funding social care, hospitals and schools properly? Back to you, Bob. Thank you for your question. It's a, a very important issue. I looked at the national debt this morning online and it was, uh, I think, £1.664 trillion pounds and, and rising. And that's distinct. That's the overall position. The national deficit, is, I, me I must mention, is another factor. And that's the annual amount we're in deficit each year. And that's come down from £152 billion each year <coughs> in 2009-10 to around £52 billion. Now, your, your question, now, I don't, I don't think it's a choice between the two, the national debt and, and public services. You have to get the national debt down and the national deficit. And as I mentioned, we're reducing the national deficit, being quite successful at that. If you can get that down, you reduce the amount of money that we have to borrow, you reduce the interest that we're paying on the money that we have to borrow. A very large part of today's government spending is interest on debt. If you get rid of the interest on debt, you can start putting that into the NHS, into education and other core public services. So it's not a choice. You can, you've got to have both. We've got to carry on reducing the deficit, balance the budget, and therefore be able to increase the funding of all of our public services. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Bob. Ah, okay. So, Tim, the national debt or funding schools and hospitals? I actually, um, I mean, I, I disagree that, that the, the question was asked about what's your priority, and I think there can be a definition of what your priority is. And at this election, Labour have made clear that our priority is investing in the future of this country. The current austerity programme, which has lasted since 2010, originally was supposed to clear the deficit by 2015, then by 2017, then by 2020, and then by 2025 is the latest calculation. It's, it's a target that's been missed time and again. And at the same time, we've seen the economy growing slowly and people's real-time wages, so for most people, they're actually worse off now than they were in 20. 
10 because inflation has been greater than wage growth. So this austerity approach hasn't worked, and Labour are calling for a different approach at this election. We're saying that we want to invest in this country's future. If you've studied history, you'll be well aware of what Franklin Roosevelt did following the Great Crash in the United States in the 1930s. He invested in his country, he invested in its infrastructure, and, we, and it led to economic growth and led to America becoming the greatest economy in the world. We think it's time for a change in approach. Austerity isn't working for people. And so that does mean investing in schools so they're all better educated. It means investing in our health service so that everybody's healthier and can go to work quicker if they are ill. At the moment, we've got a million people waiting over 18 weeks for their operations on the NHS. That is counterproductive in every sense of the word. It means that people are waiting a long time, unable to work because of their operation. So I think at this election, Labour made a very clear choice. Bringing down the deficit is important, and we're going to do that by getting the economy growing again and getting the economy going for everybody. A £10 minimum wage means that there's more po money in the pockets of most normal people. And so you'll see an economic growth, that'll be more tax coming in, and ultimately that'll lead to the deficit going down and less debt in this country. Um, it doesn't have to be a choice between either cutting or borrowing. You can, you know, there's a third alternative, <coughs> and that is to actually adjust the taxes. And so we are being very honest with the British public. We are saying we want to increase... Um, taxes by 1% so that if you pay 20% tax you pay 21% if you pay 40% you pay 41% and we think that is the only long term <coughs> sustainable solution to ensuring our social care system and our NHS gets the funding it deserves it ensures that we don't actually have to borrow to help improve the NHS but can fund it ourselves every single time round and now in terms of finances I'm afraid neither Labour nor the Tories are being truthful with you the IFS this morning came out and said that actually Labour's and Tories' proposals on taxation and spending is less, debt, to quote them, less than honest. Labour would have you borrow an additional £56 billion per year, and the Tories around £23 billion a year. And the Tories haven't even fully costed that manifesto. They just expect you to give them a blank cheque to do what they want with your money. It is only the Liberal Democrats who have been completely honest. We've said we'll raise tax in specific areas, we will legalise cannabis and tax that and introduce an extra billion pounds into our treasury. And that's the way forward. So you can actually get both done without harming the people. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Marco's just, uh, I, think, I think Marco's just called both your parties dishonest there. Is there anything you want to say? I, I think what he's quoting is the IFS. And I don't think the IFS actually rigorously analysed the Lib Dem manifesto because it's not relevant because they won't get into forming a significant government. So that's why they came up with that analysis. Didn't answer the question there, but okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well, um, th thank you. I mean, in part, of course, we'll, we'll fund through real e economic growth, which will generate uh, more tax tax revenues but the How much? as I mentioned as I mentioned in, in my earlier answer a very large part of government spending today is interest on debt and if Labour are borrowing and it wasn't me who said it but if Labour are planning to borrow another 56 billion pounds they better have a plan for repaying it because the interest on that is just going to be public spending going up you have to have a plan to repay the debt and um, I don't understand why it is that they think it's a great idea to borrow so much more and also potentially to restrict economic growth which, which provides real income restrict that growth by increasing corporation tax on our companies which pay an awful lot of the tax uh, into the exchequer and if you do that you're going to get some of those companies conceivably not invest in britain or perhaps withdraw some of their operations which impacts the number of jobs we have in this country so I can't understand why Labour wants to borrow so much. I did think about my mind. Did, haven't, the, haven't the Conservatives borrowed just as much as um, Ed Miliband said he was going to borrow? Am I, am I wrong on that? I don't have the exact figure in my head, but I'll tell you this. What we have done is brought down the deficit in a way that he never would have done. But you missed your own targets. So we move but you on. never had a target. <laughs> <laughs> and we move on to another question here. Uh, so our next question is from uh, Chinazo Okoke. Where are you, Chinazo? We are a very successful comprehensive school. Within this area, there are also private schools, free schools, and possibly soon a grammar school. Which of these is the best vision for educating students in your view? Okay, so we, as a comprehensive school, 
are very, very successful. We believe we deliver an outstanding education at this school. How is, how is the policy of more free schools and grammar schools with selective education, how's that going to make things better for us, Bob? OK. Well, thank, thank you again for that question. Uh, it comes back to the principle of choice, allowing choice in local areas uh, depending upon local needs. In saying that, I wouldn't wish any government to do anything which affects the core funding for the state education system, which we're planning to increase by uh, four billion pounds over the, over the next parliament. And our spending on, the state, edu on state schools is uh, 40 billion pounds per annum now, which is at a record level. But importantly, it's about affording that level of choice at a local level where, uh, where local residents want that kind of choice while not doing anything to detract from the uh, core education system provided by the state, about providing the best opportunities for all people so they can pursue the path of their choice to do the best that they can. Yeah, we're um, resolutely against free schools and grammar schools. Grammar schools are proven in every research study to be divisive for the society that they provide for. There are some that do very well out of it, but for the majority of people at age 11 being told that they're not good enough is not a good thing for society. Also, we've seen free schools recently. I'm a local councillor in Broadfield. We had a free school go up in Broadfield and it closed two years later. It was the first one in the country to close because it wasn't good enough. And that was a huge amount of money wasted on infrastructure that could have been invested in the schools in Crawley. So we're dead against these gimmicks that take away from the fact that we need to put a lot of effort and money into getting our state education system as best as it can be for. And we've also said some of the funding for that will come from private school tuition fees. We've said that we'll increase the VAT on that to help fund some of our pledges to increase funding to the comprehensive education system. Labour is fully committed to the same level of education for all, and that should be the best education that we can possibly provide. Um, so I've just done some very basic maths and Bob said that that's four billion pounds into education over the course of the next parliament so that's over five years four billion that's less than 900 million a year extra in education that's nothing the, the black hole is much bigger than that in the finances at the moment and that's why we're investing seven billion a year into education to really give education the boost it deserves for the future and I wish to focus on just one more point and that in terms of um, what that money would go towards, if I may. So one of the things which I found when I was growing up was we really didn't have a lot of extracurricular activities, so things such as confidence building, debating sessions, um, the arts were only gaining some funding at that time, and yet these are vital to students' growth. I mean, look at me now, yet I'm here able to stand in front of everyone and debate, yet six, seven years ago when I was where you are all, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And it's only through my university years that I was able to. So a big part of what we're pledging to do is actually to broaden out that curriculum, to really expand on the extracurricular activity so everyone can be confident. So when you go for that job interview, your confidence sticks out because that's what they look for and that's the best way to get our uh, children ready for the future. And that's what I'm proud of looking for. Okay. And what about free schools that the coalition introduced? Liberal Democrats? The free schools? Yeah. Which ones? Well, the question was, do you support free schools or not? And we said no. We said we would not build any more free schools and we completely opposed grammar schools. That you introduced free schools? We both introduced free schools. It was under Blair that he started the programme. No, it didn't. In emergency schools and academy chains. Academy. Those were Blair's, Blair's projects. So we all did it. No, but you, did, you did support it. So. It's, it's a U-turn on Liberal Democrat policy to go about from free schools which you introduced. So I think you're on a hook there, uh, Marco. That's, that's, the, that's the problem with the coalition. Uh, I think so. OK, but thank you for that question. Um, we have another question coming up there from Dominic Smith. We are a happy multicultural community in a country with a rich history in welcoming immigrants. Is immigration a problem or an opportunity for the UK? So, Bob. Okay. Um, th thank you for that question. Uh, immigration is an opportunity and uh, a benefit to the, to the United Kingdom. Uh, I totally agree with what you say. We have a diverse multicultural society in many, in many terms, in terms of languages, cultures, um, uh, ethnicity and, and faiths. And that's, that's a very good thing indeed. The only point that people do make is not so much about immigration as a concept. It's about the rate, the rate of immigration. 
what you have to be careful about is the rate of immigration into any country such that you can keep your public services fully funded so that they can support the newcomers who we want welcome to this country. It's a pretty poor welcome to the United Kingdom if you have people um, emigrating to this country and then you're not able to adequately provide public services for them. So the debate politically is much more about the rate of immigration rather than immigration itself, which again, I, I state, is an opportunity and a benefit uh, to this country. Okay, thank you. Tim. Yeah, I'm uh, in favour of immigration. Crawley is a town that 70 years ago nobody lived here. It's a town built on immigration. That could be immigration from overseas or immigration from within the country. But what we've done in Crawley is built a properly multicultural community. Yesterday I spoke at the vigil to offer Crawley support to Manchester and there was a, people from many different backgrounds there. Now, what we have seen, though, from the current government is constant rhetoric on immigration and targets such as immigration down to the tens of thousands per year, which, again, is another target that's been missed. And, and it's not a target you've realistically tried to achieve because I think the wiser people within your party are aware that immigration is a good thing for this country, but you still talk the talk even though you won't deliver it on it. And that, the reason for that is that you're appealing to UKIP voters who are against immigration. And we've seen that in Crawley as UKIP stand aside in this election for the Conservative Party. Now, what happened in the EU referendum was that there was a lot of hatred stirred up. We had Nigel Farage standing in front of a poster saying, when's too much? That, as far as I'm concerned, is unacceptable. And if you were part of that campaign, I think you'd be ashamed of it. So I'm proud to be a, uh, in favour of immigration. We do, though, need to make sure and this argument about services isn't typically right. Most immigrants who come over here are coming over here for a job. And so they're already fully trained and they're unlikely to need health care. But what they do need is housing. Housing is a big issue in Cordy. We're aware of that. As a local council, we've got a thousand more council houses on the way. And the Labour Party nationally has planned to build a million more houses. But this is a good problem to have. We've got good ed uh, employment in Cordy. So it's a problem that we're happy to try and deal with. But Ultimately, we're in favour of immigration as a party because it brings diversity into this country and through diversity, we're a good thing. And a final thing is that we've got a history of, as an island nation of 2,000 years of different ways of immigration coming in, be it Angles, Saxons, Danes, um, Irish people from, in different generations. A whole history of immigration. It seems to me a bit rude at this point that we make the decision after 2,000 years of going, we'll take them in, to go, no, we're full up now. I don't think that's fair and I don't think it's acceptable. Okay. Just to, just to say there, Bob, I believe I, I believe I heard Tim say that the Conservatives have taken on the mantle of UKIP. How do you feel about that? Well, no, that's, that, that's not uh, correct at all. Uh, I'm on the, apart from anything else, I'm on the Liberal wing of the party, personally, and I, I don't have anything to do with uh, the UKIP position on, on immigration. Mm. OK, well, that's fine. I'm just uh, repeating well, back Bob the effort. Not, but Others within this party, I think, are quite keen for the UKIP support. Yeah, it wasn't a personal thought. It was oh. the, the Conservatives are, you know. No, I mean, we, we, um, we welcome immigration, but uh, at levels that enable us to provide uh, for newcomers to this country properly. And um, the housing, the house building uh, is, is a, a good example. We would need to ensure that our house building programmes are set at such a level that they can cope with whatever level of immigration that we have. So I believe you're the immigrant stock marker? Yep, half Croatian, half English. <laughs> yes, um, from day one, Liberal Democrats will guarantee the rights of EU nationals to remain. Because after Brexit, a lot of their lives were left in limbo and the government at the moment is currently treating them as a bargaining chip rather than a human being. And that's an utter disgrace. So from day one, EU nationals will have a right to remain in the UK with the same rights as UK citizens themselves. And we believe immigration is a huge opportunity into our country. And they pay taxes, they come here, they work hard, they're our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues. And it is completely incorrect to say anything apart from that on the matter. But also, I want to say, the Conservatives are being very untruthful of you about the future and post-Brexit, the trade deals. Because, for, in, for example, Theresa May went to India last October, slash November. And the first thing the Indians said to her was, OK, we'll give you a trade deal, but the first thing we want to do is be to lower your visa restrictions so more of our citizens can come to the country to study, to work, to learn. And Theresa May said no. So the message we're sending out to the world is we want your money, but not your people. And that's an utter disgrace because we are an open, tolerant and diverse nation. Oh, 
anything to you to rebut that at all, Rob? Well, I do say um, that we are a welcoming nation, and it, it's too early for anyone to um, predict what the conclusions will be from our, the negotiations with our European Union um, countries. But of course, what is important is to recognise that those negotiations will start within 11 days of the general election, and you need someone who is going to back for, for Britain and for the principles that, that, that we all believe in. You need a, st a strong leader to do that. And I'm sorry, but the Conservatives have not been strong because since Brexit, they have sat on their hands. They've let the civil service sit on its hands and not prepare a plan for Brexit. You have stalled the negotiations whilst the EU partners have carried on preparing. They have their agenda ready. We don't even know who our lead negotiators are going to be. It's an utter disgrace. You're not ready. We're not going to be ready for these negotiations with a Conservative government in 11 days' time. Um, I, I assure you that we will. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> now, we've wandered back into Brexit territory. Anything else you wanted to add to that, Tim? I, don't, I mean, I, I think it just bears in mind we can't say, oh, we don't know who our Brexit negotiation team is going to be. This, there was no need for this election to be called, let's not forget. The, the, the government had, if they wanted, far, three more years to run on this. And they called this election purely and utterly because they saw a large lead in the polls and thought, oh, we'd like a few more extra years on top. And unfortunately, when you don't actually have a vision for the country of what you want to do for the country and you just want pure power and you haven't got anything to deliver and you come up with policies like dementia tax that sees nothing, nothing like strong and stable leadership but you turns within three days, I think the, the country is seeing through this blatant power grab and electioneering and is punishing the Conservatives for its attempts at trying to deceive them. And there, there was no need for this election. And if you're worried about who's going to be in charge for fight, the, the negotiations, why did you offer up an election in the first place? All right. Can I? On that? Mm, pleasure. Well, we could clearly have gone to the end of the current parliament uh, for another three years, but we chose not to. We chose to refresh the mandate uh, in the light of Brexit, and I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And even if, and I say this on any policy, even if we conduct what you call the U-turn, I don't see that there's a whole lot wrong in politicians now and again admitting they were wrong about something and altering course and modifying their policy. Isn't it far worse to, to stick with a viewpoint? I think it is. It's not strong and stable. But, well, what do, you want, what do you want out of this? Are you, suggesting, are you suggesting, well, are you suggesting that a politician should never change their mind or concede error? No, but is that I, what you suggest? No. But, but in a manifesto launch, when you've committed to something, to you turn on it within three days, suggests that you haven't got the will of the people very much at the forefront of your the, mind. Well, the fundamental part of that policy hasn't, hasn't changed. Nobody's, so nobody's going... I made the general comment, you were critical of U-turns, I'm making the general comment that there is nothing wrong with a political party or a politician admitting they've done something wrong generally and, and modifying that stance. I happen to believe that the um, social care proposals are very much as originally tabled in that <laughs> no one anywhere, no one anywhere is, is going to be, uh, everyone is going to be able to um, retain their home and that's, that's the policy. I think we'll move on to yeah. our next <laughs> question. Probably a good time to do that. Right, this, ver this question comes from Verity Barnes. Can the UK afford Trident nuclear weapons or can we afford not to have it? Okay, so a question on uh, the UK's nuclear capability. Very expensive and is it keeping us very, very safe? That's the question. Um, so, Bob, can the UK afford Trident or can we afford not to have it? Okay, thank you for that. Um, in terms of affordability, it, it's costed in the defence programme. The, the nuclear deterrent uh, first came about under the Labour government in the late 1940s and has been maintained by successive Conservative and Labour governments over over many years. It is, it is a difficult one. I do support the renewal of, of Trident, the Conservative Party as a whole does. We believe it is the ultimate deterrent in an unstable world when you look at the actions of certain nations around the world and certain mm. leaders uh, firing off missiles, uh, conducting tests with long-range missiles. There is an argument that we are safer uh, as a nation. There's a secondary argument as well, which is that if we were to only rely upon the American uh, nuclear deterrent, that's one less kind of decision centre in, in the eyes of a potential aggressor, whereas we and the French also have a nuclear deterrent. 
But there's more to it than that. There is there's an argument as well. It doesn't defend you, obviously, against everything. Um, the, the people who you're trying to deter, it, it kind of depends on them being rational and not all of the leaders or, or groups lined up against us fall into that category. So it's a part of our defence posture which I support, but it's by no means the only part of our defence posture. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, Tim, do you agree with Jeremy Corbyn's view on nuclear weapons? Well, Jeremy Corbyn's view is the Labour Party's view on nuclear weapons, which should democratically accept the position that we are in favour of the support of the Trident missile system. I mean, just personally, I'd say that three or four years ago, I looked at Trident and the cost of it, and I thought that maybe, you know, this next time round, the world was looking relatively calm and stable. Obama was in the White House. Um, Europe was together. And I thought, you know, maybe this time around, the next time we need to renew Trident, we can, uh, we can consider it or reduce the cost of it. But since then, we've got Donald Trump in the White House. We've, got, we've left Europe. Vladimir Putin is acting even more aggressively. And I don't think that I can be certain that in 40 years' time, the security situation will be such that nuclear weapons aren't a useful deterrent. I don't think they're a deterrent to anybody at the moment, but this isn't just about the current moment. This is about the next 40 years of uh, global politics. And also, it gives us, there's two other things to say, it gives us a global stature. Now, that's not the only reason to do it, but we benefit globally from having nuclear weapons. We are one of the five people on the UN Security Council who can veto any decision the UN makes. So that gives us enormous potential. And in addition, the cost of it isn't just a black hole that that money is lost down. That money is spent in uh, the UK for the most part. And a lot of it goes to regions that otherwise would have no industry, would have no jobs, and would very quickly become economically unviable. So there are lots of benefits to it. That's not to say I like nuclear weapons. I fundamentally don't, and I wish they didn't exist. And it might be that in 30, 40 years, with different technologies and drones, the, the, the method of delivering nuclear weapons, or even nuclear weapons themselves, are changed. But in the current climate, I don't think I could say with all certainty that they won't be a useful deterrent for the next 40 years. So I'm in favour, the Labour Party's in favour, and that's our position. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. So, Marco. Should the UK have nuclear weapons or not? Um, yes, we are committed as well to renewing Trident. However, we want to reduce the number of submarines from four down to three and reduce the amount of activity they actually base themselves out at sea on. And our main reason for lowering the amount and therefore reducing cost is for one simple reason, technological advances. Um, the Russians are piloting sea drones at the moment and these have the potential to detect nuclear submarines, which of course defeats the purpose of them because they're meant to be hidden, kept underwater somewhere, patrolling the seas. And therefore, in the next 10 years, actually, tridents might be obsolete. And therefore, the best bet is to reduce the amount we have in terms of numbers, but carry on the operations anyway, just in case we do ever need them as a backup. But also, in terms of defense policy, kind of looking a bit at the bigger picture, the biggest thing we need to right now do is ensure there is good intelligence sharing with our European neighbors. And unfortunately, if you go for a hard Brexit, you're not going to get good intelligence sharing with your neighbors. And that's a big problem for us as a country. Any comeback on anything else that you've said there? Um, yeah, just, just briefly. I mean, Marco's position there about um, building out three submarines means that you, you cannot have one on patrol continuously. And if, um, if you believe in it being a continuous deterrent, you do need that. Um, that's, that's the way the numbers work. And it wasn't so long ago, and you wouldn't think it possible, but it actually happened. In the vastness of the world's oceans, one of our submarines collided with um, an, that of another country, the French of all people, you know? So it, it, I don't think your approach is quite viable if you believe in the deterrent. Although saying that France has <coughs> land-based missiles and attaches nuclear bombs to those, and yet that still can continue to be a good deterrent. So I don't think you necessarily need to have continuous at-sea operations to have a deterrent. Okay, all right, there we go. So actually that brings us to the end of our <coughs> tabled questions. Uh, I have a couple more, which you, and you, you didn't know what these questions were anyway. You knew the, the general topics, but um, I, I have a couple more questions just to put to you, Cole. Um, this is a question that I often uh, chat to our, our head of science, Mr. Donaldson, about. Um, do you think Scotland will be part of the UK by the time we have another general <laughs> election? Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, believe, I believe it will be, and I want to believe that it will be. Uh, I passionately support the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, including Wales and Scotland. 
I believe that this is a classic example of where the, the whole United Kingdom is greater than the sum of its parts. I believe we gain an awful lot from each other. I believe that England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales are all better off uh, within the Union. So I'm a passionate supporter of the Union and I believe that in response to the question, we will still have the Union at that time. Yeah, I'm passionately pro-British, and, and just on a, and I agree with pretty much everything that Bob said for a change. Um, but what I would say is that actually economically, the case for Scottish independence doesn't stack up anymore. So, the, because oil prices have come down, I think Scotland would be struggling. And in addition, once we've left the European Union, Scotland won't be able to become part of the European Union without going through a long negotiation process. So I think there's a lot of technical barriers to their dream now, but that, I, I'm sure that won't stop the Scottish National Party calling for another once-in-a-generation referendum in a few years' time. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about having another referendum soon. Uh, <laughs> how, about, how about a Scottish referendum? Um, no, I don't think Scotland will secede from the Union, but I worry that we'll just be together and the Scottish will be angry and resentful because of the fact that they voted to remain within the European Union whilst England and Wales voted out. Mm. And if we don't pursue a Brexit which actually supports a lot of what Scotland says, <coughs> people just won't be happy. And I think rather than just being together and united, we actually need to be, make sure the Scottish people are actually happy with the basis of um, our position once we leave the European Union. And that's why we need things such as a second referendum on the final deal to make sure that actually even the people of Scotland can agree to actually the future of our country together. Otherwise, those resentments will just carry on into future generations, and I don't think anyone wants that. But Marco, what happens if the second referendum still votes to leave and Scotland still votes to stay? You haven't made it any better. It has, because it's actually given the people the choice. But the Scottish people have still disagreed with the, the majority of the British opinion. But, yeah, no, but, but Marco isn't asking for an in-out referendum as a second referendum. Yes, um, yeah, let me just clarify on that. Um, what we're, it's better that the Scottish people actually get the say rather than they're dictated to by the British government overall because, of course, a lot of what Scotland has is devolved matters and it's going to affect them as well what kind of Brexit we have and they have to give the Scottish people the right over their destiny and I'm sure that's actually how we can come together at the end of it and accept our future. Mm. Well, I, I, I think I, I was always concerned when the um, referendum occurred that it might create a, a constitutional problem if parts of the United Kingdom voted to remain and um, England, as it were, um, uh, voted to leave and, and we've encountered that. So I do believe that in any uh, Brexit negotiations we must take account of the views of those parts of the United Kingdom that did vote um, to remain. I think that's the democratic thing to do. It's difficult because you, you've got 27 different countries who you're negotiating with, but it's right to try. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. So, um, now I noted on, on question time last night that actually there wasn't uh, any politicians there. National campaigning, I understand, has only restarted again today uh, following the Manchester <laughs> attacks. I, I think it sort of behoves us to, to, to ask the question, though, following the Manchester attacks, what, what does that mean for the next government of this country? Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we need to co continuously reappraise how we look after the security of everyone in this country. It is one of the first duties of government. I think all parties would, would agree upon that point. And we need to direct our efforts um, at counter-terrorism, of course, and also in terms of uh, building and, um, and improving relationships with countries all around the world, because the, the terrorist attacks that have been happening over the last couple of decades or so have been um, quite indiscri increasingly indiscriminate in that they're attacking uh, countries all over the, the world, those that aren't necessarily aligned with any military alliance or anything of the kind. And so we need to, to recognise that. We also need to work across communities within the, within the United Kingdom to point out how valid the democratic way is and that's the best way uh, to change things, to change policies, to change um, events in the world. It's going to be challenging, but we need fundamentally in this general election to uh, display our unity in support of the uh, democratic process and campaign and attend hustings as we are today. Importantly, 
uh, to go about our daily lives and to uh, face down people who would uh, seek to destroy our way of life. Yes, I mean, ultimately, we can't let them change what we do normally. We have to have normal life carry on as, possible, as it does, because otherwise they are winning in a strange and perverted way. But ultimately, you know, we have to accept that what they are doing is utterly criminal, utterly reprehensible, and cannot be allowed. Can we do anything to stop them? Um, obviously, labour in favour of more police. I think um, there's an argument that could be said for saying that more police might help in preventing future terror attacks, but it doesn't mean you'll be able to prevent all of them. There's something like 500 active terror suspects within the UK, and there's been something like high single figures versions of terror attacks that have been foiled since the Westminster attack, but before the Manchester attack. So clearly there's a lot of um, issues that need to be covered by the police, and we need to make sure they're given the correct funding. But one thing that Jeremy Corbyn has touched on today is to consider what else is... There's, to be clear, there's nothing right and there's no justification for what the terrorists do. But at the same time, we have to consider, is everything that Britain is doing, is anything that Britain is doing in the foreign policy... Um, aiding the recruitment of terrorists to their cause. And we need to make sure or that that is considered when we make foreign policy decisions. That doesn't mean to say that we change our foreign policy decisions, but you need to be aware of what the consequences of your foreign policy decisions are. And that is something that need, may, may need to change as a country as we go forward, is that when we make military interventions, there may be some fallout from that, as regrettable and horrific as it is, and there's nothing we can do to stop it, it doesn't make it right in any way what that person is doing, but there may be some fallout from our military interventions that were unintended. Yes, um, so the Liberal Democrats are proposing to change the kind of strategy we have um, on terrorism. So one of the aspects, there's four key components of our counter-terrorism strategy, and one of them is called prevent, and that's to do with community relations. And that has been cited by experts to be one of the big problems and challenges at the moment in countering terrorism because the community relations between the government and the communities at hand hasn't been good and that strategy hasn't in fact worked. So we're hoping to re-scratch, throw the uh, strategy away and then introduce a brand new prevent style strategy which will help actually increase that community relationship. And yes, we too are offering £300 million extra per year for the policing services to spend that money however they see fit, so whether that be uh, tackling um, online um, propaganda or whether it actually be community policing, we'll leave that to the police services to do their job. But also, um, whilst we touch on, touch on foreign policy, we will continue to have problems across the Middle East as long as we have the issues in Syria, as long as we have the refugee crisis there, that's going to be a big problem for us um, as, as a society. And we also need to make sure that we can fight that ISIS propaganda by saying that we are united, tolerant, and open as a society. And I think the best thing we can, any of us can do is carry on to help out refugees, to cap, keep accepting refugees into the country, because that shows ISIS that actually we will not be defeated, that we stand by the Muslim people and their problems. Okay, thank you very much. Well, we can say one more yeah. thing, which isn't party political. Mm -hmm. There is a responsibility on the internet companies, specifically Google and YouTube. People are getting radicalised at home without any interference from their community now. We can't just say it's up to the communities that these people come from to spot what's going on because it's incredibly hard to do so because they're getting radicalised in their own bedroom where nobody can see what's going on. So there is a responsibility for internet companies and social media companies to take responsibility for what is put on their platforms and make sure that none of it is or can be used for radicalisation purposes. That leads to another sort of free speech issue there. But um, we're going to move on to our what will be, I assure you, our last question now. And this was, this was teed up for me just by a, a year eight student just before I came into the hall here. Um, who would have the better relationship with Donald Trump? Theresa May, Jimmy Corbyn, or Tim Farron? So, Rob. Thank you. I'd um, hazard a guess here that it, it, it might not be Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, from his uh, public, uh, public statements. I believe that uh, Theresa May would, um, of course, have the best relationship, but I think she'd be good at building relationships with um, heads of state, uh, wherever they are in the world, because um, that's the kind of uh, person she is. While there are many of us who um, see drawbacks uh, with some of um, Donald Trump's announcements and, and policies, it's essential that we work with the United States. They've done a great deal historically 
uh, to defend us in, in Europe and the UK within Europe as well. And uh, we, we must never forget that. It, they're our most important ally in many ways. But I believe Theresa May would maintain the best relationship while at the same time, when necessary, um, being constructively critical of, of what the President might be proposing. Okay. Would Jeremy Corbyn have a special relationship with uh, Donald Trump? It's certainly be unique. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I, I think Jeremy Corbyn is a man of his principle and he would deal with Donald Trump as how he saw fit based on the behaviours and values that Donald Trump portrayed. And I think I, I was over in um, the United <coughs> States for the uh, US election last year in a state that Hillary Clinton won, so it's not my fault, just made that clear now. Um, but we were there and, you know, he does have some power over certain sections of their society. We have to respect him as a head of state, but at the same time, we, um, you know, we shouldn't cozy up to countries that we're not happy with the values that they're portraying. And in that election, Donald Trump portrayed some fairly horrific values towards women in particular. And there are other countries around the world that I think Jeremy Corbyn, such as Saudi Arabia, um, that Jeremy Corbyn would struggle to form relationships with. And actually, maybe it's about time that Britain plotted its own course. We've said we're taking back control once we're leaving the EU. And just cozying up to America, whoever is in charge in America, might not represent the values that Britain now represents. Maybe there's a coming, coming apart between American values and British values. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We'll be able to, to go our own way. But that's at the same time, I think there's enough in our societies between America and the UK that in the long run, Donald Trump isn't going to be their president forever. Uh, and it might be very, very soon that he's not their president if he carries on saying things he does about Russia. So, you know, just cozying up to one president doesn't help you in the long run if that president is removed. So Jeremy Corbyn would keep to his values and principles and, and have the necessary relationship with Donald Trump, but it probably wouldn't be a particularly friendly one. Uh, how would Tim Farron <laughs> get on with Donald Trump? So ultimately, Trump is president, so you kind of have to work with him no matter what, because at this moment in time, they are one of our best allies and they do help us out with a lot of intelligence sharing as well, and that's really important. Up until the leaks, it, up yeah. until the leaks uh, this week, of course. But ultimately, and I liked Angela Merkel's approach to dealing with Trump. We'll base deals with him, but they'll be on our values, on what we respect and what we fight for. So that means we'll ba deal with him based on tolerance, based on equality, and we will openly challenge him about his racism. Because in school, we openly challenge racism. In the workplace, we openly challenge racism. So what's the difference between a world leader? We have to stand up for our values at the end of the day as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So I'd just like to express my thanks uh, to each of you for coming along uh, this afternoon. Um, there's some pretty tough questions there. Thank you very much, you did very, very well. Um, and, and you in the room, and you also students all around the, the school as well, Thank you uh, for your participation as well. Uh, one, one main reason we do this is to make sure that you, that, you know, elections are for you. Elections are for you. Democracy is not something that happens out there. Democracy is something that happens with you. It's of the people. Um, and the most important thing is that once you leave this hall, you go out and you speak with your teachers, you go and you speak with your parents and your guardians, and you go out and when you are 18, you go out and vote. You encourage your parents to go out and vote, because without a vote, you don't have a say on any of these issues at all. Um, so please, please, please go out, uh, go forth and discuss, go forth and share. Um, when you do leave, can I ask you to go back to the classrooms that you would be for the last 10 minutes with your teachers and then you will be dismissed. Please, a round of applause for our visitors, please. Thank you.